Hey everybody, how's it going? Waffler boy. The local time is 1.44 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, a beautiful Friday afternoon here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. And our lecture on Stikinia will begin at the top of the hour, 2 o'clock, about 15 minutes from now. Go ahead and scroll ahead if you're watching after the fact, but we are live with uh, some folks. Hang on just a sec. Quick programming note before I forget. Ooh. Here's today's lecture on stachynia, uh, starting in a few minutes. And we're going to Alexander Terrain on Sunday morning. Well, that's interesting. I don't know anything about Alexander Terrain. Actually, I know one thing. So I got 48 hours or less. I got less than 48 hours to figure out what I'm doing, but the one thing I do know, it's pretty damn cool. So we're gonna build a lecture around that. And the, the, th the part that I, I, uh, I wanna share with you right away before I forget, uh, next weekend, next Friday, and next Sunday, a week from this Sunday, um, I'm not gonna live stream, I'm visiting my mom uh, back in Wisconsin, this was planned um, for a few months, and then I, I started thinking, boy, I'm really, I guess I'm going to be live streaming from my old house in uh, in Wisconsin. And then the more I got to think about it, you know, I want to enjoy my time with my mom. I don't want to be <laughs> focusing on this stuff. So I'm taking a weekend off next weekend. I hope you understand, and then we'll be back to this. Uh, the following weekend. So we'll do, we'll still do, you know, all 26. We'll, we'll go all the way to Z. We'll just push back a little bit further into December. Well, hey now, I think we need to uh, say hi to folks, ask where you're watching from, and of course, are we functional? Hello, Devin UK, 5x5, five five, Vancouver, Washington. Hello, Patrick, age 7. Switzerland, Kalo Jara, Scalia, good to see you, 5x5. Five five. Walla Walla, Washington, Matt's 5x5, five five. Jason, Shoreline. I noticed the audio was a little uh, distorted last uh, episode. I was, I was, I guess I was shouting, I was extra excited or something but felt like my, my voice was pegging out just a little bit so um, great to see the five by fives but uh, I, I'm trying I've got a, a well it doesn't matter I've, I've got a couple of different mic uh, transmitter combos and I'm kind of playing with those options to see if there's any difference hello Debbie uh, Dorset UK the Metau Armadale Australia Sunnyvale California Indian Head, Maryland, uh, too fast for me to read, Port Orford, what are we, we got over 300 people already, damn son, uh, Leightonville in the house, uh, Portsmouth, UK, Jennifer's in Boise, Hotel Papa 100 in Switzerland, what up homie, uh, Hungary, Germany, Uh, hi, Joanne. South Wales, Bitterroot, Bend, Oregon. Fat Salmon in the house. 
Jim's from Chico, California, Northern California, Minnesota, State of Confusion, Kyle, aren't we all? San Francisco, Mequon, Wisconsin, Oxford, UK, Lebanon, Oregon. So it seems like we're functional. I am a fair ways away from the house, but uh, Townie Steve refuses to be denied. So we've continued to tinker. This is plan F, I don't know, <laughs> speaking of alphabets. Uh, bless his heart, he's, he's spent so much time trying to help me out, for free of course, just, uh, just uh, paying me back, quote unquote, for, for the, the class that I uh, delivered last winter. So I don't want to jinx it, but I think we're good, even though I'm, I'm ways away from the house. And uh, I learned from last Friday, I've got uh, the blanket from the cozy fort draped over the phone so we don't melt the phone. I mean, it is, it's 70 degrees. I think this is the last nice day. I think a big front's supposed to come through tonight and tomorrow, and I think it's going to be like, I don't know, 15 degrees cooler on Sunday or even tomorrow. Okay, I, I've got some thank yous. So Jason and family from Portland uh, dropped by last Sunday, and Jason... Is another one of these craftsmen, Russian olive. Look at this. So this is not his profession, this is just a hobby. Jason Goodrich, Russian olive, September 2020. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Jason. And Kendra, his wife, and the kids, met everybody. Uh, Kendra made some jewelry for Liz, or maybe Bijou, I'm not sure. Beautiful uh, earrings. So thank you, Jason and Kendra from Portland, Oregon. Appreciate it very much. Junius in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, is a fan of gold and sent me this book on the Comstock load and I'm always interested in reading new things especially once I get done with these exotic sessions I can start go back to reading some other things for a change even though I'm having a great time with this exotic series uh, I see your note here uh, Junius oh Jay sorry Jay it's Jay from Wilmington, North Carolina. Thank you for the very kind letter and uh, the book on the Comstock. I will appreciate, uh, I will enjoy reading that. Cute little box from Bellingham, Washington, the Thompson family. The big reveal. Can you guess what this is? From the Thompsons in Bellingham, Washington. Hello, Nick. This is a catnip rock for Bijou. We hope all is well at CWU and learning geology keeps on rocking. The Thompson clan. Thank you, Thompsons. The rule is we can't play with the gifts until uh, I thank you. So this box has been with us most of the week. So Bijou will be torn loose on this thing uh, soon enough. Thank you. He's napping right now. Rick in Northwood, Ohio, who uh, runs the Herzell Canning Company and Farms. I think he married a Herzell, I think is what he said. <laughs> he married into the family, but uh, he's been watching the programs back in Ohio and he really has been enjoying himself. So he sent an amazing box 
a gift box of a variety of the products from the Herzl Canning Company. And it was my turn to make supper last night and I made some pasta, Rick, uh, with some of the pasta sauce and I still have an amazing variety. So this episode of Nick From Home brought to you by Herzl Canning Company. You gotta love it. Thank you, Rick and family. I don't know, that's that's a lot of gifts. I was gonna save this one till Sunday, but I can't. It's it's right here. I have to share it with you. It's from Kay in Seattle. K in Seattle, K-A-Y. She's in Renton, the Seattle area. Oh, the sun's just going behind a cloud. This is good because we don't want glare for this. Okay, you ready? This is from K. A laminated poster. Okay, I don't know how long it took you to do this. I think this is an exhaustive list. I think this is almost all the food props that we used last spring during all 75 of those live streams. And then of course, dead center is the main food prop we're using this fall. I don't think we'll put this in the living room, Kay. I don't think Liz would be up for that, but I will have this in my office on the wall and many of the students will see this and not understand what, what the story is. So thank you, I love it. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. I, how long does it take to do something like that? It's gotta be a long time, so thanks. Joanne, from Wisconsin, thank you. Uh, I gotta put this poster in the house. I don't want it to blow away. I wanna take good care of it. Hot mic. Hot mic. He's inside the house, hot mic. Good thing they can't hear me on the hot mic. Sure is a good thing. Hey, I didn't swear or spit or anything. I'm proud of myself. Um, we got just a couple of minutes before we start. Uh, we're approaching 500 people. Um, can I ask one more time, since I'm a fully... Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm already thinking about what I want to talk about. Yeah, you know, right, you know what I want to say. I'm double checking. I, I don't want to think. You remember last, did you see us live last Friday? Oh my God, what a, what a clown show that was. The phone literally stopped working because it was too hot and I was buffering before then. So thanks to Townie Steve, we'll make it through today without an issue. Okay, I see a lot of five by five, five by five plus, good Lord. Good Lord in heaven. Okay, uh, give me two minutes, would you? Collect my thoughts and we will begin talking about stachemia. Thank you for joining us. See you soon. Uh. 
hot mic. Nick, it's a good thing that you've come to your senses. My name is Lauren. And uh, Nick, there are children watching. So I'm glad that you have decided to be a good role model and remove the alcoholic beverages from your repertoire. That's French, Nick. Yeah, well, okay, Lauren. It's all about the kids, Dick. Think of the kids. I am, Lauren. I'm thinking about the kids. Maybe they want a three-dimensional human being. Oh, prop, 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 prop. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a beautiful Friday afternoon here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I'm your host, Nick Zentner. I teach geology at the college here in town, and I continue with these live streams devoted to exotic terrains of the Pacific Northwest. And many of you now are sufficiently pumped up to the point where you've actually purchased this thing the second edition of Roadside Geology of Washington by Marley Miller and Daryl Cowan. And I don't know, you got it. It's right there next to you. You're ready to go. And we're not really going to Washington again today. So you're like, what are you doing, man? Are you playing with us? We got only have 26 letters in the alphabet. I thought the whole reason for these exotic, this is you talking to me, by the way. I thought the whole reason for these exotic terrain sessions was you wanted to learn more uh, or make a major leap forward in understanding the exotic terrains exposed in the, ex in the Pacific Northwest, specifically uh, the North Cascades National Park in northern Washington. And that is true. But, train boy, I've stumbled onto an approach that I think is working. And if you don't really see what I'm doing yet, if you don't really see why we've been up in British Columbia so much this series so far and why we continue to be in British Columbia today and Sunday, I might add. We're talking about the Alexander terrain on Sunday. If you don't see why we're doing it that way, uh, you're just going to have to trust me. You're just going to have to hang on. Daddy's got a plan. Actually, Daddy has a plan, but Daddy didn't really even have a plan last week. So one of the main things I did since I last saw you was to really try to think hard about the rest of the alphabet and plot out the time that I have left with you to make sure that we are going to get a substantial amount of work in the North Cascades. And thanks to Jerome Lessman, who is a geology professor at Vancouver Island University, who wrote one of the most beautiful emails that I've ever received, laying out many reasons to stay up in British Columbia before we come down here. I'm going to take Jerome's advice and continue along those lines. So, how are we using the rest of the alphabet? We're staying in British Columbia to complete building British Columbia. Stakinia is the topic today. It's more than Stakinia, though. And then by November, I'm not kidding. By, by, by late October, early November, we will finally be ready to cross the border and get into northern Washington. And I think that you'll see why as soon as uh, today. Uh, I'm very pleased with my map. It's going to look a lot different today than it has in the past. You know that master map we keep coming back to? Oh, man, I, I, I had a good old time this week. And not only... Are we talking about Stikinia and introducing some concepts that are kind of my pet names for things related to Stikinia? That's on the docket. That's what you tuned in for. 
Many of you, I was very interested. I always watch the replays, by the way. I see all the comments that you have, and I, I'm always taking notes on what people are most interested in. So a lot of you wanted to talk about the jackknife, which I mentioned a little bit last time. So that involves Stakinia and friends, and we'll get into the jackknife. But i got to be honest, I think the most, uh, the most potentially effective and exciting part of today is Act 3. I want to leave British Columbia today and go south of Washington and spend some time in Oregon and California looking for Stikinia and friends. And I'm slowing down and emphasizing things for dramatic effect. In fact, I'm even going to toast myself because I'm so pleased with myself. Here's to you. There have been a few scientific papers that have done this, that have looked at the stuff we've been dealing with in British Columbia and brought them down south to Oregon and California, but they've almost been afterthoughts. Uh, uh, Joanne and Maurice in 2007 have done this. Joanne and Maurice have done this in 2009. Oh my God, these guys, uh, that's, that's coming. Conceptually, before we get to the chalkboard, conceptually, here's what I'm trying to do and why I think I'm, I think it's official. I think I'm extra amped today to share this with you. I'm pleased with it. And to end that conceptual part, you know that I've been meaning to do this exotic terrain thing for a long time. I've never sat down and taught myself a bunch of this stuff kind of from scratch. And by forcing myself to keep more, more or less a schedule, I'm forcing myself to, to go through all this stuff. I've always wanted to do it. I just never set the time aside. But in addition to that, which you've heard a few times already, here's the new concept that is pleasing to me, and I think we'll use it again when we get to the North Cascades. Here it is. When you go to the Blue Mountains in Oregon, there are some names and there are some concepts and there's exotic terrains. If you go to the Klamath Mountains in southwestern Oregon, there are some different names and some different stories and some different concepts. And then you go to the Sierra Foothills in Northern California and there's more names and there's more stories and there's more cross sections. Act three today is basically gonna say, we can follow Stikinia, Cache Creek, and Quinellia from where they're exposed the best up in British Columbia, and we can find them again in Oregon and California. And I'm not the first to do this, and I'm not a researcher, you know that. I'm a synthesizer, I'm kind of a storyteller based on trying to find narratives that I think will work with a big audience. But I think there's a potential, if, unless I screw it up this afternoon, I think there's a potential that this one will stick. That you'll view some of these areas in Oregon and California differently. All right. Well, I set the bar high for myself now, right? So let's give it the old college try. He goes to folder number one. Let's see what's inside. Act one. Act one starts with a paper that I used to use when I was teaching Pacific Northwest geology in the early 1990s. And I don't mean to pick on David, who I don't know. Uh, but look at this. This is, man, we were all using like early Apple computers. At the, it was like a, this is like an Apple IIe or something like that. And we're it's like, ooh, look at what you can make with your Macintosh. Of course, things are a little different now, more advanced. But at the time, this was cutting edge. But I used this diagram and I remember teaching, oh, the Wallawa terrain in, in northeastern Oregon. Uh, this gentleman from Santa Cruz is talking about the Wallawa terrain and it used to be down here and it's kind of up here now and it's kind of analogous to the Galapagos Islands which are out in the ocean today. And the message of course was these exotic terrains are far traveled and uh, this is just one of hundred, more than a hundred of these terrains, and God knows where they came from, and they're all here now. Well, just as a teaching choice, I'm not sure if David was pointed it out this way, but as a teaching choice, I kind of didn't even really think about North America being at a different latitude <laughs> or longitude. 
I just kind of said, hey, isn't this wild that we had something in the southern hemisphere that now is, uh, you know, just to the uh, north of Baker City, Oregon? Well, here's from 2010, Ted Irving, and I don't know, Kent. And at first glance, you're like, well, this looks kind of weird. I'm just trying to set the hook here. Just hang, hang with me. Uh, let me give you a second to look at this. One thing they're doing uh, is lumping Rangelia and Stichinia, our topic today. So just ignore Rangelia for now. We don't know about Rangelia, but just the idea that we did have this island arc. That's the first major message. Stichinia was an ocean island arc, a line of uh, volcanic islands out in the Pacific for sure. Uh, but look at what these guys are trying to do. They're saying in the late Triassic, I'm reading backwards, 225 million years ago, North America was at this latitude, like still part of North America was straddling the equator. And here's a decent guess for the location based on paleomagnetism and some fossil content, kind of like David was doing at this time. But then as we go to younger days, more recent days, 190 million years ago, 90 million years ago, 50 million years ago, and today, in other words, these colors are just tracking North America's movement. This is not a guess. We know this. And we've already kind of touched on this with Chris Scotese's YouTube channel. We know this from all sides of evidence that North America has been drifting to the north and to the west and doing this kind of wonderful kind of northward arc over the last 225 million years. But at the same time, let's keep our eye on this I don't know, is it just one big island? We'll talk about it today. But this one big island that's working its way and then eventually colliding with the edge of North America and then coming with North America because it's been accreted or attached. So my last kind of introductory comment, kind of long-winded today. Are you starting to get a sense of why this is such a challenge? How many different kinds of evidence are we talking about? Fossil evidence, volcanic evidence, we'll get into metamorphic evidence, paleomagnetic evidence. So just the disciplines within geology are a challenge. It's tough to know a lot about all those areas. Then you've got a moving continent that's at different latitude and longitude positions over the last 250 million years. And You got different names for the same thing. You got something that's a thing, like it's a thing. It's a known thing, but they call it this in Oregon. They call it this in California. They call it this in British Columbia. Oh, the guys back in the 50s called it this. Now we call it this. I mean, that's part of the headache is just trying to keep track of all these names and words and, and, and kind of get rid of most of them to try to just focus on the concepts. And that's what I've been trying to do, and that's why it really has been satisfying uh, to put this particular lecture together. So as I've already indicated, we're not just looking at stichinia, we're adding stichinia to a family that we've already discussed and kind of running with it. Now speaking of last time, you do recall that we had 200 million years ago when Pangaea is starting to break up and the black star is the western margin of North America. Do you remember we had fossils in the Cache Creek terrain that uh, we called Tethian fossils, the little Yabina fat wheat grain guys. So those Tethian fossils tell us that the Cache Creek terrain is ocean floor material that started out in the Tethy Sea, way on the other side of the Pacific, and then worked its way eventually to the western margin of North America. Now, before I started this series, I thought most of the exotic terrain material had a journey like this. I thought most of the volcanic arcs and even some craton from other continents possibly came from this far away. That's another major thing that I'm excited by. It's not as sexy a story, but some of the exotic terrains are not far traveled they're near traveled. They're pericritonic. They're positively, they're positively pericritonic. So, so the plot thickens. You got your roadside geology book handy? We're not going to use it. 
Remember, we have plenty of quinellia in eastern Washington, but there is no Cache Creek that we know obviously is Cache Creek. There is no stachynia in Washington that we know obviously as stachynia. Now, I'm saying it that way because this approach we're going to use by looking for stachynia and friends south of us, that's why I'm doing it. If stachynia and friends are up in B.C., and stachynia and friends are pretty much everybody agrees, and we'll get into it, is in Oregon and California, then shouldn't be there shouldn't there be some stachynia in Cache Creek in Washington? And if not, why? All right. You're like, have we done anything yet? Yeah, we've done quite a bit, actually. It's touchy-feely, but we've done some kind of conceptual things that I think frame what we're trying to do. Uh, skip those, skip those, skip those. All right, let's get to the meat and potatoes. So, what's the format we've used when introducing a new terrain. We look at the big map, Mappy McMap. We look at a strat column, looking at the kinds of rocks and the ages of the rocks, and then we do a little bit of interpreting of what those rocks are telling us used to be the scene when those rocks were being created. Right? Does that sound familiar? We did that with Quinellia and with Cache Creek. We're doing it right now. He goes to Mappy McMap. I promised it was going to look different. In fact, it looks so different, i got to cover up half of it. All right, dramatic reveal. It's still not windy. It's amazing. All right. So let me give you a chance to soak in the majesty here, first of all. Some of this looks familiar. Some of it looks familiar but different and then something looks brand new. I'm cutting you off right there because there's, no, there's another half to this that I've made this week. Okay, well, the brown we know is Old North America and the passive margin. End of story. The blue, the, the royal blue we know is Quinellia, correct? Wonderful. Now, as I was starting to add this week, I was not happy with the silver gray. It didn't stand out very well. And I guess I'm in charge. Whatever. I decided to change the color. Sorry, Patrick. So this is now yellow added to gray. What would you call yellow and gray together? Uh, grello? Yay? Yay doesn't work. Grello, okay? Gray and yellow together is Cache Creek. Now, I'm not cluttering us up with a bunch of labels of what the colors are. I just, you know, I'm, I'm using, using the old kisser here. All right, Cache Creek is Grello, and there's another sliver of Cache Creek. That was last episode. This thing I had colored royal blue, but I, I now have to fess up that this is clearly not Quinellia this far north. So I said, I don't want to erase. That's going to make it messy. So I'm going to take the royal blue, and I'm going to add some brown I think so I don't know what this is dirty brown I don't know what we call this but this is the Yukon the Yukon Tanana I've had many viewers say you're saying it's not Tanana it's not like banana even though it's kind of spelled like it like I'd love a banana I'd love a Tanana no it doesn't work I guess it's pronounced Tanana so let me peel a banana so we're so far north, I'm not really going to talk about Yukon, Yukon Tanana. But that's what this is. And I included it here, and I colored it this dirty brown, muffler boy, because notice it comes up and around and comes back down to Prince Rupert. That's a big point for Act 2 today. So wrapping around this Light blue, and if you haven't guessed it, light blue is stachynia. Look at the size of stachynia. It's the largest exotic terrain in British Columbia. Maybe the largest terrain in all of Western North America. Stachynia, the topic today. But I want you, before we lose this view, to realize that stachynia does not go to Santa's house 
the Yukon Tananaw wraps around, and we'll come back to the wrapping around. I can't hold it. That's the frickin' jackknife. That's the jackknife. That's the oral cline that we will discuss in a bit. Okay? And you're like, well, what's out here? Well, terrains that we haven't discussed yet. Alexander's out here. That's coming on Sunday morning. Uh, what's down here? Well, that's covered up. That's the Columbia River basalts, and that's my backyard as well. And I'm not ready to show you a similar look, but further south, because I want to tease you. Okay, so that's our map of where Stikinia is located. Okay, what else did I promise for Act 1? Stikinia Strat Column and Stikinia Story Time. Going crazy with my Sharpies here this week. All right. So I don't have a full program just talking about Stikinia. I kind of knew that ahead of time, but I really knew it after I got into it. Because Stikinia, the main message is Stikinia is a twin. It's a twin of Quinellia. Look at the similarity in ages of the bedrock within Stikinia. Stikinia is the light blue, remember, and the royal blue is Quinellia. And even Cache Creek, which we know is significantly different, is also in the same age ballpark. Now we have Pangaea, the supercontinent, existing during this time between 300 and 200 million years ago, but I'm not saying that these guys are part of Pangaea at the time. But I am saying from this strat column, that we have similar rocks, you can read them as well as I, similar rocks to Quinellia, and different rocks in Cache Creek with an asterisk. And the asterisk, remember, is Tethian fossils. So this is kind of half review from last week. The review is the basement of Quinellia and the basement of Stikinia, a surprise to me, are old North America affinity. So do you remember that we had a rift to get some of old North America out into the Pacific? We rifted away Quinellia and we rifted away some, of, some more of that to become Stikinia. But then once these two guys were out in the water, we had volcanic activity and we had true island arc uh, action. But just to say that these two guys are volcanic island arcs from across the ocean is not appropriate according to these oldest rocks in those two exotic terrains. They didn't travel nearly as far as Cache Creek. How do we know Cache Creek traveled so far? Because it has these Tethian fossils. These fossils that for sure, according to paleontologists, are microfossils that when they were micro Scopic animals were living only in that water of the Tethy Sea, which is in the southwest Pacific. Okay, well, I don't know if that turns you on or not. What story can we tell from this then? The twins. So I have two sisters, and they're younger than I am, and they're twins. So all growing up, it was Nick and the twins. Like, yeah, I went to the grocery store. I took Nick and the twins. And uh, are the twins coming to the birthday party? Yeah, the twins will be there, Susie and Sally. So the twins. The twins. The twins. So this is only me. You're not going to read a scientific research paper and have them be calling about the twins. All right? So that's just what I do as a teacher. I come up with kind of dorky names. And it would be super embarrassing if I had a whole group in my research group that I was trying to impress. But I'm not trying to impress anybody. 
I'm a free agent, man. So I'm going to call from this point on, and we might continue to call, at least today, Stikinia Island Volcanic Arc, a line of volcanoes out in the Pacific. Quinellia, a different line of islands lined up out in the Pacific, the twins. And in between, and I didn't emphasize this last time, but I want to this time, there's a lot of basalt that is the basement of much of that exotic limestone that has the Tethys fossils in it with the Cache Creek. So instead of just saying a sea mount, which is kind of thinking of these kind of little gumdrops out in the water, I think I want to upgrade that to big things called ocean plateaus, oceanic plateaus. And I'll show you some examples uh, in a second of oceanic plateaus that exist today. But this is our concept. And remember now, one of the overarching messages that I have for you is that I was teaching exotic terrains wrong for the last 20 years. I was talking about North America and these terrains being added one at a time. And conceptually, we have the first terrains arriving on the edge of North America inboard of the last guys to come in and add, that's outboard. But to say that everything came in one at a time, one at a time, is too simple. And you'll see why that's too simple today. In fact, it's not that, it's not that Quinellia came in, and then Cache Creek came in, and then Stikinia came in, and some of you have already gotten wind of this, they came in together. They hooked up out in the ocean, and they came in as a super terrain called the Intermontane Super Terrain. And it's more than just these three. Remember, Quinellia has a little bit of Slide Mountain in it, which is thought of as a different terrain by some. But I'm focusing on these three guys, the Holy Trinity, the twins. Well, okay, we're getting too much. Last thing from Act 1 is the Cache Creek problem. And I think we go back to Mappy McMap to make sure we see the problem. We know the colors now, right? Dark blue and light blue. The two blues are the twins. You got them? And a little bit of grello in between, the Cache Creek. OK, well, where are the twins on Mappy McMap? There's Quinellia, royal blue. There's Stikinia, light blue. Here's the grello, Cache Creek. What's the problem? Do you know what the problem is? If the two blue guys, if the twins, are rifted stuff from old North America, and they are, the basements of them are, how do you explain Grello, which is from the other side of the Pacific, sandwiched in between the twins? Let me repeat, because this is a big question, and it's the whole reason we have the jackknife. I shouldn't have to re... You can just re... Oh, I'll do it again. The, the Cache Creek problem, and has been for a long time until the early 1990s, where it was satisfactorily modeled by Mitch M., was that it's very difficult, if you bring these things one at a time, to explain how you can have something coming from all the way across the ocean and have something on this side, outboard of it, that's from North America. North America affinity, like Indonesian affinity, North American affinity. How do you explain that? Well, that's what Mitch, uh, well, many others before him, apparently, but Mitch uh, created some diagrams that I really love, and we're going to that right now. So we are to act two, and Mitch, I didn't practice saying his last name, and I emailed him, but I'm sure he's busy. I haven't heard from him. I wanted to say, how do I say your name? 
Well, Mitch is a British Columbia geologist who's been involved in some amazing work over the years. Uh, and so he'll, we'll keep coming back to Mitch's work, especially with a gal named Karen Siglock. Hope I got you. Hope I got you hook, line, and sinker now. I hope, I hope you're waiting. Hope you're ready. All right. Cache Creek problem. How do we solve it? How do we come up with a model to explain that? Well, if you really want to get into the gory detail and go right to the source, I recommend this paper. And, you know, I go through a lot of science papers. I usually read them as PDFs on my desktop and email to myself. And my buddy Andy in Cleellum sends me stuff. But if it's particularly exciting for me, I print them out. Old school. I'm old school like that. I print them right out. And uh, Noah's Joanne, who we've talked about before, is a co-author on this. But this is the Cache Creek problem, basically. What does he call it? Entrapment. Or a clinal paradox. We're going to jackknife the damn thing. So I'm going to try just to do this quickly without drawing. I thought I was going to draw a bunch of stuff on the chalkboard, but I think I just decided I just want to do it verbally with you. So I've, I've taken, uh, so this is 1994. This is a long time ago now, you know? And he's put, so the, the graphics aren't quite up to standard with uh, many of these beautiful looking science papers that we've had in the last 20 years even 10 years, but I've colored here. This is me coloring. There's our buddies, and there's this uh, uh, problem, this paradox, this difficulty in explaining. I hope you see the problem, and we're moving on. So I love simple diagrams in a very fancy scientific paper. So here's Mitch saying, look, here's the old way. We got uh, Quinellia, dark blue, Cache Creek, and Stikinia, and then, you know, there's stumps that arrived inboard of that, Slide Mountain, I guess, um, maybe Yukon, Tanana, and then here's some stuff that came outboard, came later. He says, can't we do a little bit of folding to explain how we can get this far-traveled thing sandwiched between all this other stuff that came from North America, what if we made a little boomerang? What if we did a little uh, folding of, of the terrains? And before you go, well, I don't know how you could possibly say that, uh, the power is in Mitch's diagrams here. So I'm going to slow down and let you really soak these in. Again, I'm going to read backwards now. So Mitch says, once upon a time, are these in order? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yep. So Mitch starts his story 260 million years ago, and for the next 30 million years, he already has the twins connected. So right off the bat, we need to make some kind of long, skinny terrain. Stikinia is not out there by itself. Stikinia has already hooked up with Quinellia, or vice versa. And yes, in honor of UK from Renton, I have a new food analogy. I went down to Safeway an hour ago in special honor of you. What food analogy would work for this long, skinny, intermontane super terrain where Canelia and Stikinia and eventually Cache Creek and even a couple of other dudes are going to all get together in this long skinny super terrain. Baguette, pita bread, Slim, oh, Slim Jim, I like that. I'm not a Slim Jim fan but I would have sausage links, <laughs> lasagna, I oh, got everything. <laughs> All right, well, I think your ideas are better than mine. But anyway, I got, here's what I got at, Super, at uh, Safeway. They're not in season. String beans. So we got a lot of terrains here. I'm just going to grab one of them. I'm going to grab a good looking one. This one, I don't know where these came from. It's like way too late for these. Okay, so our analogy today is a string bean, 
I know they're called other things, but I like string bean. Like, hey, string bean, how you doing? I used to be a string bean. Age 16, hey, string bean, how's it going? Tall and skinny? They don't call me that anymore. It's like, hey, uh, hey, fat ass. Sorry, Patrick. So string beans, that's our intermontane superterrain. So a segment of this will be st uh, quinellia, stichinia, vice versa. Doesn't matter. Our orientation is going to be different, but we're eventually going to jackknife this sucker. And that's what Mitch is trying to help us see. Now, before we get too involved in his model, which holds up apparently, it's still being used today, 30 years later. Uh, Mitch is not only saying, here's our proposal at this time window, our intermontane superterrain, and what's the yellow here? That's Grello, right? That's the Cache Creek Oceanic Plateaus. Remember, the Grello are, is something different. That's not only an ocean plateau, but remember, the Cache Creek also is this amazing melange, an accretionary wedge of material. But he's saying, what if we do this? What if we have a bunch of these ocean seamounts, that's Cache Creek, coming from the other side of the Pacific, and bringing that stuff in to the string bean? And you're like, wait, I don't think that even happens today, does it? And that's what Mitch is doing. He says, well, yeah, like today's Hawaiian Island seamount chain, the Emperor seamount chain, that's heading towards the Aleutians, And the Curiles, modern analog for a proposal of what was offshore somewhere at this time. The somewhere is still a work in progress. Then we're going to leave, we're going to get a little bit younger. Let's go from 230 to 208. What's different? Not a whole lot. We're bringing, I guess we brought a couple of the uh, Cache Creek guys in. Mitch is saying, how about this being similar to the Antgon Java Plateau? Now, these are geographies I don't know very well in the South Pacific. You might know about them. But these are modern analogs of perhaps what Cache Creek looked like back at this time off the coast of North America. And he's got the Yop Trench where our string bean has already been bent. It's already been jackknifed a little bit. Okay, pick up the pace, bro. More from Mitch. This is a paper in 1994, trying to explain how we can have exotic cash green terrain sandwiched between two volcanic arcs that had a North American origin. Now we're really jackknifing things. Cache Creek getting closed in between in this date. And he's still using the Yap Trench, which I've just colored in a similar way. You see the boundary between the Asian plate and the Philippine plate. I don't think I'll narrate as much now, but we can see we have completely, can I do it even? Kinda, I just snapped it, but. Cache Creek got caught in between. And the, the concept is, uh, and, and you'll see an animation in the Cozy Fort. The concept is, how can I do this now? So if this, I'll get a different bean. Glad I got more than one. So uh, you're, uh, you're like kind of looking north now. Uh, that's not even appropriate to say, but anyway, here's, Here's our Stichinia and Quinellia string bean, and I'm bending it, I'm jackknifing it, and the concept is the ocean floor carrying Cache Creek seamounts, Cache Creek submarine plateaus, and we're going to accumulate a bunch of junk at the trench where I'm subducting Cache Creek floor in the jackknife. And then we keep closing the jackknife. Let me say it one more time. Hope this works for you. The model that still holds for the Cache Creek problem is to have our 
two individual volcanic arcs, Dakinia and Cornelia, hook up out in the ocean. I've got a date for you in a second. We start jackknifing the damn thing. At the same time, we've got far distant Tethian fossils in the Cache Creek approaching and diving beneath this jackknife as it continues to close until we eventually close my knuckle and have Cache Creek caught between the two limbs of the orocline. So he says that the tightness of the orocline is between 187 and 174 and the Molucca Sea is a modern example of that. Innovative work. I maybe spent too much time on that, but I think it's cool. And he's got the same kind of, that's kind of one of the reasons I had the idea to do our strat columns in that way. If you really want to see that paper, I'll bet you'll be able to find it. There's the title. 1994. Now remember, Joanne is the co-author on that beautiful book, Geology of British Columbia. Joanne is here with the Cannings. And we're going to come back to this and talk about the Alexander terrain, but she also is showing the jackknife, and that's about what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you some Joanne maps now that add a little bit of spice to what we've been talking about. Almost done with Act 2. You've seen these before, but now that we know the twins and Cache Creek sandwiched in between, maybe we can focus on that. So if we go back this far, this is our topic next time. Terrain's coming through the Arctic, but we don't have any, oh, you know what? So before I show you these maps by Joanne and others, uh, these are the three dates that I think are important for our intermontane superterrain, for the idea that we actually have uh, the string being put together and then folded. Um, to get the basement of Stikini and Quinellia, we need to rift away a part of old North America that started about 390. And then the Slide Mountain Ocean opened up. And at 290, that ocean between Quinellia and old North America was at its maximum width. And that apparently is the same time that we hooked up we hooked up the twins to make the string bean. Then the jackknifing transpired between these two dates. And after we do the whole tacoing of the thing, we fold the string bean. The twins are almost touching each other with some cash creek in between. We accrete the whole frickin' thing to North America, 170 million years ago. That's a big date for us, 170, give or take 5 million years. So with those dates in mind, which I've already forgotten, but maybe you wrote them down, we're too early for the rifting here, so we move on. We're still too early for the rifting here. We haven't even rifted the beginnings of the string bean on this map. Aha! But 360, pretty sure that was the date I had for you on the whiteboard. As we've said before, the red line here is rifting the basement of Stikinia, Quinellia. In other words, the twins are born, and I'm ignoring Yukon Tanana because I don't understand it, and I can't even pronounce it properly. But we've got the beginning of the string bean. Let's keep going. Okay, now we've got a good-looking string bean. She even colored it green for us. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Are you really, are you kidding me? Parts of the string bean, parts of the intermontane superterrain are the eastern Klamaths and the northern Sierra foothills. Huh? What was that? 
Yes, that's where we're going in Act 3. But there's good evidence, and I don't have that evidence for you. I kind of ran out of time, plus I don't know if I, I saw it easily. What, what rock evidence proved that these guys were soldered together as one big stream being 290? I can guess, but I don't really know. And here's next Sunday, or here's a couple days from now, Alexander. Let's finish it before we look at some uh, stuff in Oregon and California, and then I'll show you a couple of animations that are dynamite in the Cozy Fort. Uh, we're approaching, accreting the string bean, but we haven't really brought the Cache Creek in, in yet. Last panel. There we go. We jackknife the string bean. We bring a bunch of Cache Creek ocean floor and accretionary wedge into the gap, and we make it work. I'll explain these, what look like cold fronts here, in just a second. I saw some of you were asking about that before. Now conceptually, I don't know if you're up for this, but I'm going to try it anyway. Let me just show you this first of all. Can you get your bearings on this? This is where Kathy lives. This is Australia. Does that look familiar to you? Australia and the rest, that portion of the world. Now, Mitch and others say, I'll tell you what, if you want a good visual of what the string bean and the twins being folded and the cash creek comes in, if you want a visual of that, take this map of Australia. Can you please flip it? Can you please make it a, a mirror image of itself? And then can you please turn it 90 degrees? And if you do that, you see what he's done? Maybe he's not the first. But this is worth pausing and really thinking about. He's taking present day Australia and surrounding volcanic islands and volcanic trenches and ocean floor and ocean seamounts, and he's doing what I just said and saying, that was North America and all this archipelago material out in the early Pacific to bring this all together. I tried. I don't know if that worked for you or not. Uh, but if, if you're up to that and up to really thinking about that, it's a really interesting modern, modern analog to what we're trying to visualize off of our shore. It's uh, quarter to three, perfect timing. Here's the last act and especially our viewers from Oregon and California, or folks that know those areas, might get a charge out of this. I have had some videos sent to me, by the way. I've had uh, three so far, and I'm saving them because they did them in the North Cascades. Our field correspondents, our, our less than three minute geology videos, they did a beautiful job, but I'm gonna hang on to them for now. Okay, why not? Let's look at the addition to the map. And what was the whole point? Now that we know how to identify the twins, dark blue and light blue, Grello, Cache Creek in between, can we follow the twins south? Drum roll, please. The twins. So let's just slow down and pause for just a second. What basic observations can we make? Even though we know about the jackknife and we know about this pattern and we know that there's a lot of this stuff exposed in British Columbia, there's a reason we learned about them up here first. 
I've shared with you before that when I go directly to the Blue Mountains or the Klamaths or the foothills of the Sierras or the Golconda in Nevada, they're almost always talked about as individual stories. And what I'm trying to do here, I hope you get the main thing I'm trying to do. I'm trying to remove the individual stories and talk about the grand story. I'll say something different. With a couple of question marks, for the most part, field mappers now see that both twins and Cache Creek are in the blues, both twins and Cache Creek in the middle are in the Klamath, both twins and Cache Creek are in the Sierra foothills. And this is probably Slide Mountain, the ocean that I lumped in with Quinellia. What else can I say? We'll keep coming back to this. This isn't going away. But again, I, I, I had this brainstorm to just add. And this is a hand-drawn map. I mean, Washington's too small, whatever. What else can we say? Oh, are we going to add a bunch more terrains in here? Why is it all white? No, we're not. Because everything's buried. This is all we know about the exotic terrains of Oregon. We don't know any more than this. Except for some Celestia, the last terrain to come in. Ditto for Northern California. Ditto mostly for, for the, uh, Northwestern Nevada. But remember, this is my target area for November. And before, I get, before we get dropped in here by helicopter, I want to do the same thing. I want to look, can I continue the twins somehow into the North Cascades or Cache Creek? So far, all I know is that Quinellia comes into Washington there and doesn't really enter the Cascades, doesn't really enter North Cascades. I really like this, and like I say, I'm not the first to do this. It's been buried, and even maps like this have been buried in a few science papers here and there, but to me, this is the main story. And just, I'm not going to say the word conceptually again, because I've already said it 17 times today, but I don't know about you, but I have very little patience and very little interest in details until I understand why I should care about the details. And unfortunately, many of my field trips over the years as a student, you know, it's cold and windy and whatever, and I don't have the right clothes on, and then we're just dropped off in this quarry somewhere. I'm talking about Wisconsin. It's like, yeah, make a strat column and uh, make sure you get the sharp contacts and the gradational contacts and the ooh light zone and, you know, I'll pick you up at four. Why would I want, I, mean, I guess you're training me to be a field geologist, I get that, but I don't give a shit about this detail. I only want to know the detail until I have the grand story. That's just me, but I think it's maybe more than just me. And this is a great example of that. And when you go to the Western Idaho Shear Zone or these other places, without knowing how they correlate to other areas, I just lose interest. So that's why it was exciting for me. And that was the big moment today. But just in case you don't see the power of what we were trying to do here, I, ca I came up with a little schematic. He goes to the third folder. I wasn't kidding, man. This one's got meat to it. We're, not, we're, all, we're approaching the top of the hour, and I'm just starting Act 3. So let's see if this works for you. I need a nice... Uh, I'll do it this way. I've always wanted to do this. This is like for me. Like every time I read or do a field trip, in some of these locations, I just, I knew there was a bigger story, but I just never took the time to try to do something like this. But I'm, instead of going exclusively through the dense scientific papers,
these books were a tremendous help. Again, this is the sweet spot between the dense scientific papers, which are tough going, tough sledding. You lose the will to live on occasion when you read some of those papers. There's so, so much detail. And then this is also more helpful than some real fluffy little thing that doesn't have any information in it. So Marley in particular was a great guide in Oregon with her book. These guys in Northern California, etc. While I'm at it, also this book of the Hell's Canyon area by Tracy Vallier. So I am using popular literature, dense scientific literature, roadside geology books, videos, I'm trying to grab everything I can and then put some kind of story together. Ellen Bishop with some photo slash dense geology books. So there's lots of ways to get on this information. You want to see this again? So we're color coded. Royal blue for Quinellia, Grello for Cache Creek, light blue for Stikinia. You're like, what's up there? I don't know. I don't know. That's where we're going in November. The North Cascades. I don't know. I don't know how much Stikinia or Cache Creek is in the North Cascades. We know there's Quinellia in Washington. Have you seen these terrains? I think there's a consensus now. Uh, we might have some people correcting me in the comments. I'm totally fine with that if that's true. But all that I read, there's a consensus that Olds Ferry in the Blue Mountains is Quinellia. So again, new names. It's the same stuff. It's just got new names. Baker. And then this is a question mark. People don't know what to do with the Wallawa terrain. Uh, my best effort is to link it with Stikinia for a couple of reasons, but that one might be a mistake. The Martin Brit, okay, I'm just scratching in what to me are famous rock layers within this story. The Martin Bridge limestone featured in the Hell's Canyon programs is, is part of Wallawa. Same idea if we go to southwestern Oregon. These are the terrain names in Marley's Roadside book and a few scientific papers that I read. You might know some of these local rock units, which I don't, but apparently they're used pretty regularly. And then down by Chico, California and climbing up into the High Sierra, uh, this is a reach, but I did the best I could. But these two, especially the Shufi complex, are correlated to Quinellia beautifully. And even if we get into Nevada, Quinellia slash Slide Mountain. So just to follow through on that, let me give you a little bit more detail to confirm that this is a real thing. This isn't me totally freelancing here. From Marley's Roadside Book of Oregon. Here's the Martin Bridge. Wallawa terrain, fine. But we're linking it, aren't we? To Stikinia, the topic today. Uh, let me go in order. What else I have? I have, hang on. Can you hear that power drill? So you may be aware that there's a bunch of smaller mountain range names that are collectively called the Blue Mountains. So when I say the Blue Mountains, I really mean all these guys together. So if you're more familiar with the Elkhorns or the Strawberries uh, or the Wallawas, I'm really talking about the Blue Mountains as a general region. And I don't know if you can see, but I, I tried to, to draw in Olds Ferry, Baker, and Wallawa, which is really to us today, Quinellia, Cache Creek, Stikinia. The twins. Another beautiful map. Marley makes such beautiful maps. I don't know how she does it. Wrong colors for us, but showing the three terrains. Bill Orr, I've talked about his books before. He has a little schematic here for the Blue Mountains. There's the Twins and the Cache Creek in between. Now you know that I'm very gun shy about drawing uh, ocean plate reconstructions. And there's a big old reason for that. And that's coming 
in a, in a, I don't know, a week or two from now. But I'm staying away from any of this detail here with plates and what the plates were doing. And you'll have to just wait until the Karen show to see why. Now, there's another reason that I'm excited today. We're finally, we're finally, uh, our table setting is finally paying off. We did six table setting episodes. Getting the magic window. This was episode one, do you recall? We're going to accrete our terrains in this window, and we're doing it now with the string beans coming in at 170, was it? 170? The, the string bean is coming in after that complicated history of, of jackknifing, etc. But we did that with table setting. We did our basement glimpses with table setting, and now we truly understand we do have just glimpses beneath all this cover. But a whole nother reason for the table setting was the paleogeography. Do you remember this one? The fact that from Philip King, the fact that we have stuff in, in northern Washington that appears to kind of have this crazy swing through Oregon and down into northern California. Why? Well, we talked about the clockwise rotation and the basin and range extension as a reason for that. And we realized that if we restore Oregon to the way that it was before the clockwise rotation, before the basin and range, you'll have to look at that paleogeography show to get the details. Then we realized that the Blue Mountains and the Klamaths were basically parallel to the shoreline of old North America. And yes, if we do that, and we realize that in the Klamaths of Northern California and Southwestern Oregon, more colors, wrong colors for us. I'm not slamming the map makers, you know, when I say wrong colors. I'm just saying for our, our color scheme, you can see why this is confusing. We got the wrong color, we got the wrong names. This needs to be royal blue. This needs to be grello. This needs to be light blue, according to our scheme. But remember, this used to be parallel to the shoreline like we talked about in that show. To finish out, if we go down into Northern California, this is from the Roadside Book of Northern California by Alton Hidman, the granddaddies of the whole Roadside series. I guess I didn't realize they did this if they were involved. We haven't, we've been ignoring batholiths, we've been ignoring plutons, granites of any sort, we've been ignoring volcanic signatures, we've been ignoring a lot of things just to kind of talk about these terrain basics as they come in. But in these other colors, wrong colors, we've got for sure some Cache Creek and some Quinellia, question mark if we have any Stachinia in this area. Okay, I think you have the message now. And I guess I don't have my diagram that I drew out. It must be still upstairs to explain those black teeth. So that'll have to come next time. Okay, we are done with the program out here before we go in the cozy fort. But I hope you're starting to see not only we're almost done with making British Columbia, we just have two more basic episodes, maybe three, to put in the rest of the terrains here, outboard of these guys. But we're not going to do any more here because we don't know any more here. Everything's buried. And then and only then will we be ready to dive into the North Cascades. Okay, boy, this is a long episode. I hope you're still with us. How many we got? 700. Okay. Uh, cozy Fort time. I still see comments scrolling by. That's a good sign that we are functional. No wind, kind of amazing. Uh, I'm going to miss this weather. Boy, it has been spectacular weather. I'll tell you that. I hope it's been OK where you live. Now, the star of the Cozy Fort 
There's a guy named Avana, A-V-A-N-A. And I've received maybe just two or three emails from Avana over the last few years, but they're always super detailed and super on point. And I made a couple of discoveries about him. And I'd like to share some of his work with you. I don't know anything about him except he's some sort of designer, some sort of website designer that lives in New York City. Uh, but you'll see why I'm sharing his uh, work with you in just a second. I'm muting me. I'm turning the volume on. I'm closing our live chat temporarily. Um, Okay, before I get to Ivana, I just want to give you a little snippet of a couple programs that you may have seen. Oh no, I need to do this now. So here's a website for you. If you go to Google and you type in Earth Science Online Video Database, five words, can you do it? Earth Science Online Video Database. Ivana in Brooklyn, New York City area, has put together an absolutely jaw-dropping database of thousands of earth science video programs. He's got them all categorized by subject, by creator, by year, and I think it's safe to say any video program that you remember seeing back even in the old days, like the ones I'm about to show you, Ivana's got them in his database. Earth Science Online Video Database. Maybe somebody can link to it in the comments below to help out. Uh, but um, I put two and two together, Ivana, uh, and I'm so grateful for all that work that you've done. Uh, here's just a little taste of a video called Exotic Terrain made back in the early 1990s. I used to show this in my classroom with the old VHS tape player. It features Tracy Vallier in Hell's Canyon. Nothing known about it. There are very few places in the world right now where you can go into an area that's been unmapped that another geologist hasn't worked on. So that was really a, really a challenge. It still is. Geologists soon learned that the Hell's Canyon region was very unique geologically. It is located in some of the most rugged terrain in the Pacific Northwest. This area includes Hell's Canyon and the Seven Devils and Wallawa mountain ranges. It is known as the Wallawa terrain. Okay, it goes on like that. It talks to him. It talks to George Stanley, who's a fo fossil person. It includes Ellen uh, Bishop, uh, who does serpentinite work. Uh, all those videos from the early 90s have like music that puts you to sleep. I don't know why the producers chose that. I don't know if you caught the uh, narrator. Let me play the narrator's voice again for you, see if you can recognize him. He was in, uh, a voice on a very popular 1970s show. The research in the Pacific Ocean continued to solve geologic mysteries in the Pacific Northwest. Correct, Sean. Geologist Ellen Bishop works in the Greenhorn Mountains of eastern Oregon. This area is known to geologists as the Baker Terrain, which is named after Baker City, Oregon. John Forsyth. For years, geologists working in the Baker Terrain could not explain how these rocks form. They are highly altered and mixed up like no other rocks in the region. We'll stick it with it. This is Ellen. This solved when Ellen Bishop was doing research at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. My colleagues at Scripps were dredging the Marianas Trench, looking at ocean island systems in the Pacific. And they kept coming home with the same kinds of rocks that I was finding, except I didn't have to use a ship and a dredge to find these things. I just had to walk through the Greenhorn Mountains, and I came up with the same mysterious assemblage that they were finding in the South Pacific. Once again, the present became a crucial link. So, well-produced program. I don't know who funded it. USGS, maybe. U.S. Forest Service. I have no idea. But again, 
just a story from Northeast Oregon. There's no connection to bigger things. And to me, if I was making a program like that, I'd, I'd have a bigger scope. I realize that's not what their, their uh, task was, but um, that's what we've done here today. We've zoomed out to a bigger story. Now, I want to share another YouTube channel with you that I think you'll enjoy. Many of you are really into geology. Let me give you a look. Have you been to this guy's site? Robert Lopez. Robert Lopez. He's an excellent instructor, a geology instructor at a, I think it's a community college in the, I don't know, is it uh, kind of San Jose area maybe? I've, I've, I looked up, I googled the name of his school, I forgot what I did with it. Uh, but he has a lot of online geology videos, mostly focusing on California. And he's got a three-part series on the Sierras and the Klamath accreted terrains. Here's a little taste of Robert Lopez using, you know, just, a, just an overhead projector, and he's just drawing out some cross-sections. And some of this I'm going to challenge with our brand-new work, but that's not to slam Robert. He's doing amazing work with his students. And up until six months ago, I wouldn't have known we have some new data that kind of blows some of this stuff out of the water. And then they've added a Raji. Several things have hap are going to happen in this one here. This one includes uh, you're going to accrete those Nevada island arcs with the with the with the Tethian um, Tethian affinity. Tethian affinity. Right. So they have the Tethian affinity, and then you're going to dock this this ophiolite, this smart bill ophiolite, which is really going to be par also part of this. This coast range ophiolite. We'll we talk haven't talked about, about ophiolites, ophiolites yet. We will. And then the interesting thing is that these island arcs uh, are going to, once they, once they subduct into that Maloney's fault zone, that, that foothills subduction zone, these, these arcs are going to clog up that subduction zone and cause subduction to really focus back that, over here. Does that look familiar? He's even got yellow. Tracks. So here I say clogging of Maloney's fault zone. Um, so he's down in the weeds. Foothill subduction. So it's gonna, it's gonna end. So he's down in the weeds with a bunch of Sierra foothill end. stuff. And this is right around. But you've got my point. We can bring Stakinia, Cache Creek, and Quinellia. If you ask me, down through there without a problem. And then suddenly we're talking about BC correlating with those places instead of having a totally separate story in California, let's say, which is a common theme. The Californians sometimes. Uh, view themselves as the center of the universe. I'm not slamming Robert, but there's uh, we can get into that more. Okay, back to Ivana, who again put that database together, but I'm going to read you a part of his email. I don't care if we're late. I got this from Ivana a week ago. Um, Hi, Nick. I hope all is well. I'm enjoying the new backyard series on exotic terrains. I just wanted to share this animation with you, and I'm about to share it with you of the tectonic terrain evolution of the Cordillera from 200 million years ago to today. The original content slash reconstruction is from a scientific paper by Henderson in 2014. Now, I've, I've looked at that paper, and it's a good paper, but here's what Ivana did. All I did, this is Ivana talking, was extract and format 100 still images that they released as part of a PowerPoint presentation, and I put it into a movie that's much easier to view and navigate. Now, we're going to keep coming back to this. I'm slowing down here and saying that this, this little video, which is an animation put together by one of our viewers, Ivana from New York, is going to be used regularly by us, and it's using very recent science work that's a perfect setup for a bunch of the stuff that I want to do now that I have a plan, thanks to Jerome Lessman at Vancouver Island University. I'm going to read a little bit more. The reconstruction that Henderson created was, making, was made using G-Plates, which is a paleogeographic GIS software that combines actual paleomag data and plate tectonics kinematics slash math to create realistic reconstructions on a virtual globe through time. I don't know anything about Ivan. I don't know if, if, if he's got background in geology or not. He must. Their data is cited in the file linked above. I personally find this to be one of the most comprehensive and accurate, as much as one can know, reconstructions out there based on some really good work listed in their references, which includes real rock-based geological constraints, 
accurate paleomag data, the, and geometry of past subducted arcs from mantle tomography. That's a little sneak peek. This reconstruction incorporates several important ideas. Baja BC, you're going to have to wait. Alaskan terrain train wreck, you're going to have to wait. Evidence for the past locations of arcs, volcanic arcs, based on imaging their slabs in the mantle, you're going to have to wait. Rotation of Oregon and Blue Mountains and Klamaths, we've done it. Basin and range extension, we've done it. California transverse range block rotation, I don't think we'll do it. Salinia, Baja, Mexico, and San Andreas translation, that's coming, you gotta wait. I've seen quite a few of these reconstruction models and very few of them successfully show this many different ideas at this level of detail and in a single animation. One caveat, is that it shows only known or exposed older Mesozoic terrains from their original palinspastic position until today. So Cenozoic cover, in other words, recent stuff that's covered it up, isn't shown, and it's just left blank in places instead. Anyway, I was hoping that this animation might be of some use to you in your teaching, maybe via the cozy fort sometime. Well, it's happening now. So there's no sound on this. I can put my lapel mic back on. I hope you're sufficiently pumped to see what this is. And I've looked at it, I don't know, Ivana, maybe 10 times already, and I still don't totally understand what I'm looking at. So I'm just gonna play it a couple times for all of us now, and you'll just have to take my word that we'll eventually uh, grasp all that's on this. But this is custom made for you by fellow viewer, Ivana. I am going full screen on this one, damn it. I'll just play it first. It's 51 seconds long. Where's the date? Hang on, where's the... Oh, it's up there, sorry. Let's try again. I gotta get the date in the... So let me just start you first of all. Do you see, I'll keep this in your frame. This is how many millions of years ago we are. Okay, sorry about that. Here we go. What in the hell is going on? Sorry, Patrick. Oh, my Lord in heaven. And we're to today. So, I... I guess I'll show it one more time and I'll try to show you what I think are the twins, but I'm not even totally sure I'm looking at the right thing. I think I'm looking backwards now. I think that's the string bean. That's the intermontane super terrain. And it's coming back out. What the heck? Is that true? And this is part of the topic for the next time. There's another string bean to come in. But then there's more stuff hooking up. I thought the big event was, I'm looking ahead now, I thought the big event was 100 million years ago, and, and this looks like Baja BC to me. Okay. So I shared it with you twice. I don't know, maybe I should... Ivana, can you help me figure out how to just like, I guess somebody can just, can you link to this down below maybe, Ivana? And people then can watch it on their own. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the heck out of that and I'm very grateful to you. That's essentially another gift. Uh, now not to upstage you, but there's a brand new paper that came out a couple months ago and it tries to do some of the same thing, but with a different look. And I'll just do this very quickly and then we'll be done. Uh, the intermontane here is purple, wrong color. But our string bean of today, Quinellius, Kenya, Cash Creek all together, our string bean is gonna be purple in this picture. I'm not going full screen. 
but this came out from a research group that we'll talk much more about. And they've got these cold front looking things which I'll have to explain on Sunday. Purple is what we're looking at today, but obviously there's a bunch of stuff outboard of us that we're gonna have to deal with. I'm shocked by half of this. So we are quickly getting into, yeah, I have to say it. I'm giving you a sneak peek at the new thinking. In case you haven't got caught whiff of this right now, until now, there's a big revolution happening right now involving this exotic terrain stuff. And there's young people with some new ideas they're not all young, but there's a group with some new ideas that are completely changing the way we view how and when these terrains came in. Or even if they came in, maybe North America went through the crowded pedestrian crosswalk. So if that's not enough to keep you motivated to join us, um, I'm not sure what I can do uh, because it's not just stuff that was all figured out 30 years ago. It's evolving before our very eyes, and it's tremendously exciting. Okay, I'm perspiring in the cozy fort. It's time to crack a beer. It's Friday afternoon, and we go to your questions. If you're new to us, give me a second, first of all. 320, this is a long one. I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with this one, and I hope you are too. This episode of Nick From Home was brought to you by Iron Horse Brewery in downtown Ellensburg. Cold weather's coming. Do you got your snow tires ready? Have you taken the storm windows off the house? And have you gotten your cozy sweater IPA. If not, come on, to, is it an IPA? Vanilla milk stout, whatever it is, it's damn delicious. TGIF. I got to go back to school and meet some students, but they'll understand. I'm sure you have questions. Uh, pop in the chat out like a boss, right between the eyes. I'll probably get carried away here, but I, I, I'm thinking 10 minutes. Scrolling back, looking for some uppercase. I'm ready for you. Thank you for, pay, for waiting. Where does IZ yeah, I ignored the IZ terrain. Um, Kay Edmondson, thanks for the question, in the Southern Blues. The, the IZ terrain is a fourth terrain that shows up on a lot of maps. Oh, I didn't concentrate on pouring very well. Um, I've seen a couple cross sections where it's not real bedrock of a terrain. It's kind of an overlapping sequence. So I chose to leave it out. Marley's got a good treatment of the IZ. I don't know much more than that, so I just chose to leave it out. Sorry. Steve, has the co-joined island arcs of Quinelli and Stikinia been stretched as the jackknifing would seem to show them extending from northern Cali to British Columbia and back to Cali, capturing the Cache Creek terrain? Uh, I think you're ahead of me on that, Steve. I don't have a good feeling for scale. I have to look at those animations again to see exactly how long the string bean is compared to the size of BC, let's say. And it has to be long if we're finding the twins in the string bean all the way as far south as central California, right? So unless we're cutting it in half and doing a bunch of offsetting on strike slip faults, I think it does have to be as long as you say. Um, but I think there's more to your question than I can handle at the moment. John, hi Ned. 
ABC question, does the 2500, does the 2500 mile long Mendocino escarpment not relate to, contribute to, or interfere with any of the terrain migration models? In my humble opinion, it should have its own lesson. It will. The Mendocino, well, the Mendocino escarpment, I don't think I know what that is. But we do have to address the San Andreas Fault, and we will, John. When we talk about this concept of Baja BC, that's another major complication that we touched on with our strike slip fault show. So I guess we've already done it now that I think about it. But you may be talking about something else that I don't know about. Thanks for the multiple choice, but I'm going to say D, none of the above, because I, I don't really understand and I'm drinking beer. I appreciate you, John. You're particularly good with, with uh, adding a bunch of links down below, which, which I think all of our viewers enjoy. Kyle, wait on Sunday, would you, for the cold front lines? Yes, they're related to subduction, but I, I God, it took time to draw that out, too. I don't have time for it anyway. Ozone, were the tw twins identified linked by rock identification such as serpentinite or magnetite? Um, you're basically saying, how do we know they were linked before they were added? And that's the part I, I ran out of time. I meant to, I meant to try to figure that out. I, I discussed last episode, I think it was, that one way you can figure out when two terrains get linked is by finding a younger layer that is evenly on top of both. So if you have the age of the overlying sediment, you know that the linking had to happen before. So there may be some common, that might actually be the right answer. What's that called? The Bowser, Bowser Basin? I'm totally, it is. It's called the Bowser Basin. I think you can get the oldest layers in the Bowser Basin, which straddle the twins, and then you have a date for linking them, which may work with the date I gave you. We're getting out of my comfort zone now a little bit. Appreciate the questions, though. Uh, Zardozarf. Is it true that the bulk of erosion during the Holocene is due to geology undergrads doing fieldwork with the rock hammers? Thanks for the question. No. Device 9. Did Stikini and Quinellia rift off of Old North America together and then rift from each other? Good question. I don't know. Maybe nobody knows. Uh, I have to look at those animations again, but they kind of pop up. I don't think they really show us in the animation uh, what you're trying to visualize, and I don't think I have what they're trying to visualize, what we're trying to visualize. Patrick, age seven. Is the new thinking the same thing the research project you're involved in is investigating? So Patrick remembers that I'm, I'm involved as a public spokesman for a new research team that's going to be working in the North Cascades. And Patrick wants to know if they're part of the new thinking. Uh, I don't think so, Patrick. They're young, and they're good, um, and they will definitely be doing some important work. But I don't think that their work with magmas is going to be directly connected to what I'm about to showcase, which is this complete revolution in how we view where a trench is. And uh, I, I want to say more now, but I don't. I want, I want to tease you. Uh, Davey, could the hotspot now under Yellowstone cause the northwestern rotational movement? We don't view it that way, Davey, and too young for our topic today. Did Quinelli and Stikinia jackknife because Cash Creek T-boned it? Jenny G. That's kind of a chicken and the egg thing without thinking about a whole lot. Um, there's a whole big advanced study of things called oral clines. O-R-O, Klein, C-L-I-N-E. And I don't know that work. But it's basically structural geologists, as I understand it, who are going around the world. You're looking down from heaven now. And you can find these places where mountain ranges are boomeranged like this or jackknife all over the world. I mean, Mitch was showing us some examples, but there's one of these famously in Bolivia called the Bolivian Orocline. Uh, the Columbia Embayment, 
which is an older feature that used to exist in the Pacific Northwest, is kind of an oral climb. There's some others that don't come to mind at the moment. So I guess without thinking it through completely, um, we bend the, the string bean and that allows us to catch a bunch of Cache Creek in between. And why the bending is due to kind of some regional tectonic interactions. Pretty vague answer there. Thank you though. Jennifer, are the seven devils in Idaho actually the twins? Uh, once you get over to Idaho, I don't know how much is mapped as the Wallawa terrain, but anything that's mapped as the Wallawa terrain, and I'm saying question mark, is that's to Kenya question mark. And if we can feel more and more confident that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the Wallawa terrain and the Stikinia, then yes, Stikinia is one of the twins. There might be some much younger volcanic rock you're thinking of, though. Those rhyolites, I don't know if that's, that might be a younger story. Dean, is viscosity a factor in accretion to North America coming? Automatic scroll. Sorry. I don't think of viscosity of the plates or anything on that scale factoring into it, but I'm sorry, I lost the rest of your question. Oh, here it is. Uh, accretion in North America coming through the Pacific. I don't see how viscosity is part of it, Dean, but maybe I'm not seeing what you're thinking of. Uh, Milk Swiss, does the Red River have anything to do with this breakthrough? I don't know how the Red River, I don't know which Red River you're talking about, I'm sorry. Uh, the Garlock Fault is um, lopping off. So if we go back to the map, Again, the twins, the twins, the twins, the twins. And then there is some terrain stuff down here, but I'm leaving it off in part because of the Garlock Fault and other strike slip action that has thoroughly screwed things up. I almost said a different word there. This is almost certainly, the western Idaho shear zone is almost certainly a major strike slip fault. So this stuff looks like it's just heading to Idaho and then it just stops. I think that's real. So then like how do you reconnect these guys and were they ever reconnected beautifully? You can see how tantalizing some of these topics can be. Tim, are the laramide and antler orogenies also results of docking events? So Tim's a, a hardcore guy. He knows about the antler. Um, generally, yes. And there's this new guard that's trying to revamp the way we view tectonics in the Pacific at that time. And that new thinking also helps us come up with a new way to view the Rockies as a whole and some of these individual thrust and, fall, uh, thrust and fold events. Uh, but I, I have to do more reading to, to give you some details. And again, I, I don't think I want to go into the Rockies much. It's, this, it's the ballpark for sure, but that's a whole nother set of live streams probably. Edward, what's the, was the Russell Ranch accreted after or outboard of Stikinia? I, uh, Edward, we're going to get to the Russell Ranch, which is part of the Rimrock Inlier near Yakima, and do our best to tie it to the twins somehow, or realize that it has to be younger than the twins. But that's part of the North Cascades, in my mind, so I, I'm not ready. A few more. I love the questions. I love all the viewers. I don't know what we're at now. Can't even read how many we have. Uh, since Quinelli and Stikini have volcanic involvement, Cat Slave asks, did they have the same heat source? Yes and no. Even the new people view these island arcs as a place where you have one tectonic plate diving beneath another, just like the Marianas Trench today making the Marianas Islands or the Aleutian Islands, where the Pacific Plate is diving beneath Oceanic North American Plate. So the island arc scene is definitely 
a subduction zone where two ocean plates are colliding. Now, is that the same trench for both? Yes or no, depending on who you talk to. And we'll stay away from that. Bill, the Olympic Mountains, yes, that's another oracline for sure, but too young for us today, of course. Three more. Myra's up in Quenell. Uh, there is gypsum crystals to be found near Cache Creek. Would these have been brought in on the Cache Creek terrain or formed in the shallow sea when Quenellia and Stikinia rifted? Great question. I don't know, Myra. I don't, I don't know the story well enough to get down to your detail. But I hope you can see that this kind of, you know, we're up at 40,000 feet with our story, right? Now I'm interested in details like yours, and I really want to come down to the gypsum crystals. As opposed to what I was trying to say earlier, which is I don't give a damn about the gypsum crystals if I don't realize there's a bigger story at play. So I like coming big and then drilling down to the details, and maybe you do too, and I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you. Three more and we're done. I'm having a great time. Chris, watch that paleogeography episode, whatever letter that was in our series. Yes, we turn back the basin range extension and we line up the terrains better. Yes. Uh, could the Baja California of today become a new Quinellia and Stikinia? Thank you, uh, Janaba Sidibi. Probably not. Uh, Baja California, as most of us know, is a piece of North America, continental crust that's, that's being uh, moved out into the ocean. But there's no subduction related to that. And the, volcano, the volcanic arcs, we're ta the twins we're talking about today, are definitely from a subduction story. So unless things change dramatically as far as plate interaction out in the ocean, which I don't see in my head right now, I wouldn't think of them as future twins. One more and we're done. Scrolling back now, just trying to grab one more. This is a question from Ned Zinger. Uh, did the Kula Plate have anything to do with the Stikinia joining North America and eventually creating craters of the moon? A toast to you. Oh, why didn't he answer his question? Craters of the moon. Here's to your health. Your physical health, I mean. Your mental health, I mean. Your whole body health. You. Here's to you. Here's to the health and well-being of all your family and friends, near and far, and all the wonderful people involved around the world at all levels, building communities, keeping people optimistic the best they can. We all need it even now in 2020, six months or whatever after this all started. Here's to them. Programming note. I will see you next. Less than 48 hours from now, I got a lot of work to do to put together some kind of Alexander Terrain episode. Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific time. I hope you can join us then. And then I made a real quick announcement at the very beginning today. I'm taking the following weekend off. I'm visiting my mother in Wisconsin that's been planned for a long time. And when I really started to think seriously about live streaming from my old house 
and focusing on all this new stuff, I wouldn't have time to visit with my mother. That's the whole point. So it's mom next weekend, not you, but we'll be back to it the following weekend, and we will continue a little further into December to make sure we get to Zed. Thanks for joining us for this extra long meat packed episode. I really enjoyed putting this one together. I feel really great about putting some of those concepts together, something I've been meaning to do for a long time. I really hope you enjoyed this one and we'll see you on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Plain boy, I love you and goodbye. Nick, there are children watching. <coughs> Goodbye. <laughs>